All right, now that everyone has introduced themselves, uh, we will um, proceed with the itinerary. So the first thing that we need to do is approve the meeting minutes for the November meeting. Those of you that are members of the committee uh, received that in the email yesterday. Uh, you can, uh, if you need one more uh, second to look at that, you can access that on your devices. Um, I'll give that about uh, 30 seconds and then entertain a motion to approve if no one has any questions. Yeah, I'll put forward a motion. These look good. Hearing no uh, immediate murmuring or chattering, I will uh, entertain a motion to move the minutes. Please uh, give three seconds after I stop talking so I can mute to avoid delay. Entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, sorry, Bryce, I put one. I said uh, we could I would entertain a motion, but I guess it didn't come through the first time. Sorry, I didn't quite catch all of that, but you're saying you're just reviewing these minutes for the first time? Oh, no, I was saying, here, I'll put my microphone. I was saying that I would put forward a motion to approve them. So moved, do I hear a second? Hi. Um, who was that? Was that Paula that seconded? Yes. All right. All those in favor of approving the minutes as posted. Aye. Aye. Raise your hand. So approved. All right. Let's move on to uh, the most um, I guess substantive part of the itinerary in terms of discussion. Uh, so uh, as we discussed in the November CSC meeting, uh, we are going to be uh, rearranging some finances. Uh, the Upon uh, legal advice, the Student Activity Fee Committee uh, funded the operations of student media for the fiscal year 2022, that's ending June 30th, uh, but did not fund any stipended positions as per that recommendation. Um, now, everyone did, in fact, get hired on to stipends per the population of previous year's budgets. Uh, there are no plans for anyone that is currently stipended to not continue receiving their stipend through till the end of April, which is when the uh, terms were appointed. Uh, so there's no concern on that front. What we do need to do is uh, uh, consider uh, where we can uh, both allocate those costs in terms of coming out of a, a funding source outside of the uh, the student activity allocation, since that's not adequate enough to cover it and we can't use it anyway, uh, and also um, how we can reduce expenses in some other areas. Uh, so we do have some ideas uh, to propose in that area, some of which I have discussed with the individual leaders one to one. Uh, but before uh, we go over those ideas, I'm happy to open up the floor uh, to anybody else who wants to immediately put forth any suggestions or ask any questions uh, as far as this matter is concerned. Not hearing any immediate contributions, I will I will discuss some of the ideas that, that have been already reviewed. Um, in terms of dealing with some of our operating expenses that exist outside of the um, the realm of um, of stipends, uh, the signal printing budget, for example, is is uh, running significantly under this year. Obviously, there's a number of reasons why that is. Uh, so we do believe that the signal budget, which uh, signal printing budget, which is a uh, what we would call an off the top budget informally, uh, which is uh, approved prior to any approval of uh, the student activity fee committee, that we could save uh, a five figure amount in that budget up to twenty five thousand uh, dollars without really disrupting any operations because we just simply aren't printing uh, the number of copies that we would need to out of that budget. Um, another. Um, step that's already in process is to reduce the general cost of some of the uh, programs that are already in action. Um, we just recently received a signed 
a copy of a contract to do RazFest uh, that's not signed on our end. I should uh, clarify that's signed on the venue's end, uh, so I won't publicize that just yet. Um, but <clears throat> the entire operation of that event would be done at a fairly significantly reduced budget. Um, the students that are in charge of programming that are already aware of that budget, so this is not going to come as a particularly surprise to them. Um, those are two of the more significant um, uh, savings that uh, we can uh, figure to incur. Uh, I do want to clarify that there will need to be a long-term conversation in terms of what to do about future budgeting, but um, that is something that I envision that we would talk about in the February and March uh, Committee on Student Communication meetings, so that would be something that we would table here. Um, the third most significant cost-saving measure would be to postpone hiring anybody uh, for the coming year um, those for those uh, watching that may not be uh, a member of a student activity group, um, the student leaders for student media, uh, their terms don't actually run fully concurrent with our budget. So uh, at the end of April, all of these leaders terms will end. And on May 1st, that is when we typically schedule uh, new leaders to take hold. However, the budget year hasn't ended yet. So in order to save some money, um, we could fill uh, only the, the bare minimum of positions. So the media head positions, uh, in a handful of programming positions at Album 88 uh, and postpone the hire of all other positions until July 1st when a new budget year begins, uh, which would uh, reduce the amount of stipends that we have to cover for on this end. And that is something that we did discuss uh, as, a, as a possible solution at the November meeting as well. Um, so those are the most significant ideas that are being proposed here. Um, I'll open up the floor to any other suggestions or comments that anyone else might have. Uh, and I will just let everybody in the room know that um, if someone in um, teams goes first, you might experience just a slight reverb, but it should only last a second or two. Oh gosh, I that's actually very important. I'm sorry, I almost left out. I left out one very important part of, of one detail, and Gail was very good to stay on me about that. There is one other additional factor there and one other opportunity that does present itself. Um, the specific legal edict, as was um, uh, recommended to the SAFC, was positions as uh, creative or editorial input uh, is concerned. So there are a handful of positions that we have flagged as potentially non-editorial, uh, examples being um, copy editors, um, webmasters, that... Um, the SAFC, um, per their legal advice, would be open to funding. They haven't. I need to clarify that. They have not funded them. They would be open to that. That would require making a request to them during the mid-year allocation process. Um, if anybody has any questions about that, I, I am completely deferring to Michael on that, who's thankfully nodding his head, <laughs> uh, because uh, I, he's more familiar with the mechanics of how that works. Uh, if the Student Activity Fee Committee is... Um, uh, runs ahead of budget, which is to say that, uh, you know, we, we've given out our money and it turns out that we, we have more money than we gave out. So we need to figure out what to do with this money. All student groups, not just student media, but all student groups can uh, take it upon themselves to say, uh, these are some things we'd like to fund. So that opportunity does present itself. Um, I'll open again the floor up to any suggestions or questions. Um, if anybody would like uh, Michael to clarify how that process works, uh, Gail will uh, mosey on over to him so he can do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, is yeah. my mic not working? No, I just want to join yours. It's just simpler, I think. Uh, sure, absolutely. Hello. Let me put my mask on. Um, so uh, just to add to the note in terms of content influencing versus non-content influencing, Bryce gave a couple of examples, things that, that don't have an impact or influence in terms of what gets put in the paper. So somebody who's putting the newspapers on the rack, a distribution person, they're not affecting what's going in that publication. So that would be an example of a non-content influencing role, which is eligible to seek funding for student activity fees, and then they can evaluate how that allocation is made. But um, there is a bit, there is a distinct difference in terms of, uh, and Michael's going to talk about the why, um, in terms of why there is a difference between content influencers and non-content influencers. With that, Michael, take it away. Sure. Okay. And of course, as all good people in the media know, um, in the United States of America, you enjoy some freedoms as a result of the First Amendment of the US Constitution, specifically um, looking at um, some of the clauses related to um, what the, the state, the government can and cannot do. 
as a public university, Georgia State University is the state. So anytime that we use any form of funding, whether it comes from student fees, from state allocations, any monies that are held within the university that are used to pay anybody, including students, um, that basically in essence makes you an agent of the state. When you are an agent of the state, that means you are in essence voluntarily giving up certain freedoms. Because I, as an employee of Georgia State University, um, can't just say and do whatever I want. Um, I, um, as a free citizen, can, independent of my relationship to Georgia State University. Um, and so it's really important to us that we protect the integrity of student media. Um, it's really important to us that we also protect the integrity of all of our student leaders um, and their abilities to be able um, to enjoy the freedoms that they are afforded as a result of the Constitution. And so that is where the legal precedent comes from that says we don't want to compensate or put on payroll, in essence, anybody um, who could be perceived as being influenced or controlled by the state. And so if we pay someone who is um, going to be writing articles for the newspaper or putting certain content out there or making certain independent decisions um, that are things that may or may not be reflective of the university's um, desires, then that puts us in a conflict because then either the university needs to step in and say, as our employee, we don't want you to say or do these things. Um, but yet we, as an, we as, as an entity can't tell you that if you enjoy those freedoms. So that is the reason why we cannot provide direct compensation to people who are in roles that have to be guaranteed certain freedoms. Um, and again, it, this is fairly consistent. Now, I will also say, are there schools out there that might not be following the guidance of legal affairs? I'm sure there are. Are there other schools that may um, decide to skirt certain rules? Absolutely. Um, for anyone who's not paid attention to some of the uh, recent hubbub of our, what's going on at Emory with the law school, um, and Emory's private, and they're still getting beaten up to the level that they are because um, their student, um, uh, their uh, uh, SBA um, or S SLA, I guess, sorry, their student law association, basically, um, or bar association, sorry, S it was SBA, um, their <laughs> bar association um, decided not to recognize certain groups or to give them um, access to certain uh, resources because they did not like the content of the speakers they might invite or the viewpoint that they were going to be representing. Um, we're obligated to be viewpoint neutral. We cannot be viewpoint neutral and still provide funding um, for the people who are allowed to not be viewpoint neutral. So that's really what it all comes down to. Um, now, as can, far as- can I, can I actually ask a quick question just for a point of clarification? Sure. Um, because this thought did not occur to me until just now, and so it's very important. Are, um, and you might not know the answer to this question. Do you know if the SAFC was acting upon um, is, is acting upon the legal adv advice of the university, or are they acting upon the legal advice of the USG? Because that's an important point of clarification. Um, well, nothing that we do or should do at the institutional <laughs> level should be um, outside of the jurisdiction and rules of USG. So yes, no, the USG guidance, and, and again, um, for better or for worse, where I have a lot of personal experience with this is because I've worked within the USG for 26 years and worked at an institution that um, had received multiple lawsuits over issues from students and student organizations about certain issues of freedom. And so it was the attorney general from the state of Georgia, as well as the legal office from the University System of Georgia that provided me directly with this specific guidance at my previous institution. And so when I got here and learned of some of the practices that had been going on, I consulted our local legal to say, based on the guidance I previously received from the University System of Georgia and the Attorney General of Georgia, it appears Georgia State might not be in compliance with that recommendation. And our legal affairs then looked at it and said, you're right, um, we need to clean this up. And so we did. Um, now, as far as- so the, so, so the short answer is a little bit of both. Yeah, no, no, I mean, but, but again, it's, it's, you know, one encompasses the right, other. Right, sure, sure, absolutely. The, the, the reality with the University System of Georgia, and we have to remember that there's 26 institutions of varying sizes, degrees, and scrutinies. You know, we are in the shadow of the capital of Georgia. So, of course, of the state capital. So, you know, you're going to have certain things that 
we might be scrutinized on. Um, you know, is it possible that certain schools, for whatever reason, get away with certain things? Um, often, but they only get away with it because no one sued them yet. Um, and that's the reality is what we want to do is we want to avoid being the next lawsuit. And so that was one of the most important things to me when I got to Georgia State was reviewing all of the things at Georgia State that may not be in compliance with USG guidance and with the law and cleaning those things up. Um, and, and there were quite a few, I'm not going to lie. There, there were a number of items that had just been common practice for 20, 30 years here. And because no one had either questioned it or because no one sued us, um, it just kind of kept flying under the radar. Um, and so when new people come in with fresh eyes and, and start to see things, then that's when we raise questions and we want to be proactive and do things the right way. Um, we also have to realize that guidance and policy have changed a lot and change on a very regular basis. And so, um, you know, there are things that literally every year, the Board of Regents, every summer, you know, we get um, updated guidance. Every month at Board of Regents meetings, they revise policies. So that's part of why it's important that we constantly pay attention because the things I'm sharing with you today could actually be different a month from now after the next board meeting if they were to take different actions. Um, however, what I will say is nothing in the realm of constitutional law, unless the U.S. Supreme Court chooses to make some changes, um, nothing in that realm is going to change. Um, and there have been multiple U.S. Supreme Court cases that have given clear precedent on the use of student activities monies. So again, this is not just even a Georgia thing. This is a national thing. Um, and so with all that as background and context, um, the reason why Student Activity Fee Committee, when they were looking at the total budgets, um, because it was just one big long list of positions and stipends, there was no way that that, could, that committee could determine which positions might be um, in violation of the guidance that they were receiving and which positions would not be in violation. And so that's why instead of trying to second guess and, and do so potentially incorrectly, the safest bet was to say, we will fully fund all the operational things because we know the operational costs, you know, what we pay a printer to print the newspaper, that printer doesn't care what the content of the newspaper is. And that printer can't say, oh, I'm not gonna print page three because I don't like that ad. The printer prints because we pay them to print and they're producing a product. So that we can pay for. Um, however, um, because there was no way to really determine which positions do what, that's the reason why the SAFC said, let's just go ahead and not fund any stipends for right now. Let's send it all back to student media with the reasons why we're not funding it and let student media come back to us with recommendations and with further guidance and tell us, yes, this person just literally puts newspapers out on stands. They have no control over content. They are not being unduly influenced by the state of Georgia um, by you paying them to deliver a newspaper. So therefore we can cover that expense versus, um, you know, obviously paying someone with editorial controls. So that's why um, you have the opportunity now um, to put together a new proposal. You can say, we've reviewed all of our positions and based on the guidance, these positions are in no conflict whatsoever and therefore we would like to compensate them. And of course the compensation has to be, you know, reasonable and appropriate and all of that. And then SAFC will look at the resources they have available. Um, we are working at doing a mid-year review. Our goal is to get information out by the end of January on the mid-year review so we can act quickly to get funds in February as early as possible out to all the student organizations that might be getting additional funding. Um, part of that review, any group that asks for new monies, we will also be doing a review of their already received monies just to make sure that the monies have been expended in the manner in which they were allocated and to make sure that um, there's not, you know, excessive needs that can't be repurposed. But the thing is, again, um, we want to make sure that SAFC, so like, for instance, as you think about the cost savings you have in printing, those funds, part of what you could even propose to SAFC is you could say, okay, we actually have already found a solution. We're not going to necessarily ask for a ton of more money. We want to actually just get permission to take this portion of our budget that you already allocated to us and repurpose it to cover these expenses for these individuals. Um, and it may well be that you need some additional money too, and that's okay. So you can ask for more money. That's not a problem. Um, 
But just wanted to, again, give you an example of the ways you can craft a good solid proposal that is likely to be received well and supported by the SAFC. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. A lot of information, but I want sure, to give you the big picture. So, you know, because again, obviously I'm a huge fan of, of student media and very supportive of student media. I want you to succeed. I want you to be successful. Um, and so I'm going to obviously do everything I can to work with you all to find the right solutions um, as well as create a solution to the challenges that you face. Um, so with that, um, uh, back back to the original, and, and Michael is not too far away, so um, uh, he, he may come back to the microphone quickly, but so right back to the original point of, of questioning then, um, opening the floor up to any suggestions. And again, there is a longer term conversation in terms of, of shaping future budgets that is uh, going to happen in not just future CSC meetings, but also in one-on-one -on -one meetings that I have with all of the leaders, uh, the ones in the room and that one's not in the room. Uh, so uh, this is not a, a discussion about what do we do for next year and the year after that. That's a conversation that's going to go for a long time. Uh, but this is more of a this year, what expenses do we potentially think that uh, we can reduce uh, or um, uh, cut? What expenses do we think that we could reasonably be in a position to ask for? as a mid-year allocation request. No guarantee we would receive it, but we can certainly ask for it. Um, are there any positions that we believe are non-editorial that we're missing? Uh, and uh, any other suggestions, thoughts, questions that uh, anybody might have? So again, I'll, um, I'll open the floor up on that front. Uh, um, great question from one of our guests, which is, are there any positions that we are currently not hiring for? And the actual answer to that is yes, there, uh, the, the, the stance as of right now is any positions that are not filled in light of the fact that we're not entirely sure how we're going to cover them. We have left them vacant. Uh, that would include uh, two webmaster positions, one for Neon and one for Album 88. Uh, that uh, would also include uh, one of our um, uh, two of our production positions at Neon, um, and those are the only that ones that come to mind. I feel like I'm leaving office something assistant. off. Yeah, right now our office assistant positions have been vacant, not only now but have been vacant all year. Um, so uh, I will say that uh, our position there would be to not fill them immediately either because. Uh, we don't know how we would pay for them, but um, that those positions would qualify as money we could ask for uh, because they are not editorial. So that would really just uh, come down to do we think that that's something that we would want uh, people to do in the closing months of this year uh, and going to the fee committee and saying we would like this funding for that. That is a great question. Thank you. And student office assistant positions are the <laughs> ones that nobody ever questions me on um, and the ones that always get supported. Um, are ways that we can hire students to be student assistants and to do office positions. Um, again, because that's a benefit to the student, you get some good income, and it's a direct benefit to the university and to the rest of your peers because it helps us make sure we have adequate staffing and support in all the offices. And uh, I'll also add, um, if there are any guests on YouTube that have any questions, I'm also monitoring the chat window there. So there is a slight time delay between our meeting and the YouTube uh, stream by about 30 seconds. So I might be a little late getting to your question if you ask it, but I will see it. So just uh, putting that out there. Um, any other thoughts, questions, comments, suggestions? Hey, Bryce. So in, in terms of, um, I know we talked about this previously, just want a reminder though, for the printing budget for the signal, is that like a budget that we can't touch for anything other than printing? Um, we can request permission to use it on other things. There's no guarantee that we would receive that permission, but there is an historical precedent, uh, precedent excuse me, uh, for that request having been made before. In the year 2013, um, the signal came under budget on their printing and requested that the surplus be used uh, for essentially a, a supply request, which was to replace the computers. And that, re that request was granted. So um, the short answer is we can certainly ask. 
would it be able to be turned back around into the wages of students that work for the signal or is that a no? Uh, yes to the non-content people, no to the content people. So in other words, if you, if, if you wanted to ask um, the SAFC, hey, we'd like to use $5,000 of this money to um, help cover our copy editor position and pay an office assistant, that request could be made. If you wanted to say, we want to take that money and use it to, you know, cover the cost of our section editors, they would say no. Okay. Because I think where there's a lot of waste, at least in the signal department, is the printing area. Because, you know, the signal office is filled with uh, prints of papers. And um, not only that, we don't, there, I feel like there's a significant less amount of people on campus due to Corona, as well as we don't have a distributor as of now either. So I feel like that money can be um, used somewhere else that wouldn't benefit us. And and I will, I won't, I won't extrapolate this thought because I want to make it part of the second part of the discussion, which is revenue generation. But I, I think that, that that a future point of discussion would be is is a request for uh, more funding in the future for marketing and distribution positions such to amp up awareness of the signal so that it can be in a position to create greater revenue is something we can certainly explore. But um, yeah, I completely co-sign on all of the observations you just made. <laughs> okay, great. I believe Joseph raised his hand. No, he didn't. Okay, sorry. Uh, any, any other comments, questions, thoughts, concerns? Um, if there are, are no other thoughts or concerns on that, um, there is nothing that is in stone yet because the solutions that we have proposed that I mentioned in the beginning, such as uh, the savings in printing, um, the um, some of them are ideas that we know we are allowed to do. We're allowed to spend less on RASFest this time than we did other times. That's We know we're allowed to do that. Uh, other things like using printing money on this, that or the other thing are things that need to be vetted. So um, this is not a statement of we have come up with the saving solution and it's being implemented, but rather we need all of your feedback in order to have the proper ideas to be vetted so that we know that they're right uh, and we can meet our budget at the end of the year. Uh, again, this is not a new conversation for some of the leaders, for uh, people like Dina who uh, assumed her role uh, on January 1st. It's, it's a bit newer for her, so she's catching up. Um, what I did want to segue into uh, as, as sort of a point B of conversation as it was listed on the itinerary are some uh, alternative ideas for revenue generation. Uh, and this is more of a long um, a long term question. Um, in the past, the way that student media was funded was to uh, go to the student activity fee committee and ask for money for you know stipend positions and other operating expenses. And uh, there was a, uh, a number of essential services that were funded off the top before that request, such as printing the paper, uh, a variety of radio station tower expenses. However, the signal would never ask for any money. They would always say, we are going to generate revenue via ad sales, and that is how we are going to pay our stipends. Well, uh, not just at the signal specifically, but nas nationwide. Uh, revenues for student publications, be they print, online, or both, have really dried up. So what we need to conceptualize, um, because it um, will possibly become a necessity very quickly, is how do we generate revenue? Uh, so this would be a bit of a brainstorming conversation. There are no wrong ideas in a brainstorming conversation. Um, there are no ideas that can be implemented after a brainstorm session until we know that we are actually legally allowed to do them. Uh, so I would love to open up the floor uh, to anyone that would have any ideas for generating revenue uh, above and beyond what all of the student media organizations currently do. And the guests are free to chime in on this as well. And I'm going to add to that. Can you hear me if I'm sitting here online? Can you hear me? Someone acknowledge? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I can sit far away enough from Bryce that I can take my mask off to be that much more audible. Um, the reason why the revenue piece is important is because your self generated revenue can be spent on content influencing stipends. And so that's why it's important for us to have this brainstorm to come up with some new ideas or to reinforce some of the existing sources of revenues, um, because that's how you can continue to fund at the level that you have been funding stipends. 
um, is with self-generated revenue because those restrictions are not in place if you've made the money of your own accord. It is not state money at that point, and so it is not under those same restrictions. So um, we're looking for ideas for making more money. And, I, and one other thing I will add to that, um, depend uh, uh, one idea, oh, actually, well, this will be my way of starting the brainstorming session. It's not an idea for revenue generation, but rather revenue uh, banking, if you would. Uh, I think one idea that we might want to explore is having one central um, revenue account for all of student media in which um, because it is all revenue, it is therefore capable of being carried forward into future years in an event that I'll fully admit would be unlikely in the present, but who knows what the future might bring. If there was a year where we came up with all sorts of wonderful revenue generating ideas and all of a sudden we realized we've got more money than we know what to do with, the good news about revenue accounts is that they are uh, legally allowed to be carried forward and you don't have to rush your decision. State money, on the other hand, is uh, what euphemistically is called use it or lose it money. And so if you don't make budget, um, uh, that being you don't spend all of your money, you don't get to keep it. It just goes back into the bank, so to speak. Um, whereas um, money that you have generated on your own is your money. And you can say, you know, if it's all in that one account, you can say it's our money and we raised it. We don't know what to do with it right now. Uh, we're going to carry it forward and possibly maybe even have a bit of a nest egg. Uh, as someone who has sat on um, uh, boards of uh, multiple not-for-profits, uh, they they typically say that it's a good idea to have six months of operating expenses um, sitting in a nest egg. <laughs> we we don't have any of that. So, uh, you know, that would be a possible goal. But again, that, that's, that's aspirational. But that's an added advantage to generating revenue is that you don't have to rush your decisions uh, in terms of how you use it. Um, so just wanted to make sure that was clear. Uh, any other comments, suggestions, ideas to make some dough? Uh, sure. Uh, Gail's asking, identifying current sources of revenue. Um, the university um, receives annually uh, $100,000 from Georgia Public Broadcasting as part of its agreement on uh, timeshare on WRAS. Uh, that money is deposited into a student media account. Uh, there is, of course, whatever money the signal can generate in terms of um, ad revenue, which admittedly is uh, not a lot these days, not just again for the signal, but a lot of uh, college newspapers across the country. But that is uh, another avenue. Uh, New South does generate revenue uh, as an aspirational way to offset costs for what are essentially um, contest opportunities. So New South runs an annual contest uh, that is open to the public, that being the, the larger public, the national and even international public. Um, and it funds it via raising revenue through subscription fees and contest entry fees. Um, occasionally, when they do very well, that does lead to a surplus. Um, as of now, it is not deposited into a revenue-specific account. It is posited into the New South account, and sometimes that creates some logistical difficulties. Uh, when New South does very well and it makes more money than it intended, um, it sometimes has to rush its decision about what to do with that money, which really isn't the way it should be. Um, but that is another way that revenue is raised. Uh, right now, um, and, and then the last thing I will add is that RASFest, though it is not necessarily – uh, intended uh, in its current phase as a fundraiser per se, um, as it sometimes operates as a, at a loss, you know, through no worry or intention, um, does bring in revenue. People do, uh, attendance is charged for the RASFest event. Sorry? Power. Oh, yes, yes, right, very important. Um, the tower maintenance account for the radio station um, is a uh, designed to be a revenue neutral account where money is taken in from outside vendors who pay for uh, shared use of that tower, whereas the university pays rental fees. And the idea is that what we are receiving from our co-tenants will help to offset that expense. So we do receive money, for example, from T-Mobile um, for shared use of a particular tower. Um, any other questions, thoughts about revenue generation, yeah. new ideas? And again, the, no concern about whether, like, if your question is literally, I don't know if we're allowed to do this to make money, that's fine. That's what we want to do. We want to ask some questions in terms of what we think might be viable ideas that we haven't explored. I honestly think anything, well, it's the concept of you have to spend money to make money. So any... Um, admission fee that we could cost uh, or charge students like like ticket admission fees and we have like something like a I don't know like a performer or um, just any product I haven't thought it through too 
insightfully, but just anything we can charge and create revenue that way. And then maybe if it goes well, it could be kind of like a, you know, annual thing. Um, kind of like yeah. a, a student media annual fundraiser type deal. Yeah, yeah. Something like that, like a big event where we could raise money that is separate from government or from the university itself. So we can do what we want with it. That is a good idea. One thing I will mention, because we haven't done it in a long time because COVID and other events have kind of sidelined it and it was never done as a revenue generation event, uh, is the Modern Media Conference, which is an in-house event that we would stage every other year, bringing in speakers from a variety of the world uh, of media and many of them recent or not so recent alumni. Um, to give students advice on a variety of media related uh, things. And um, if there was a way to attach a revenue element to that, whether that is to charge a registration fee to students or to um, uh, promote it as a um, external event, because the first uh, Modern Media Conference, we actually did do that. We charged external registration fees to people outside of Georgia State University. So even though it was an event for Georgia State students and it was free for them to attend, if you are a non-Georgia State student, you were free to attend or you were able to attend if you paid the admission fee. Um, that's something that could be explored uh, as, a, as a possible stream of revenue. Uh, one thing that I have talked about um, with administrators, but admittedly, I'm not entirely um, fully aware of um, the logistics of whether we would be um, legally allowed to do it, and if we are legally allowed to do it, how we would do it, would be to set up some sort of a uh, supporters account, which is uh, some, for those of you that may be familiar with websites like Patreon, um, uh, there are a lot of um, non-conventional media, for example, that are supported in this manner where you're essentially a monthly subscriber and you pay an optional fee. You can support for as little or as much as you want, and there are levels. And if you're a tier one supporter, uh, you know, you know, thank you for your support, and you get a you know tax letter. If you're a tier two supporter, we'll throw you a t-shirt, whatever the case might be. Uh, it's not anything that we've ever explored before, um, and we would um, certainly need to explore the logistics. I, I would be curious if any students on the call or in the room would be interested in exploring that further in terms of if we were allowed to do it, putting in the legwork to actually set it up and do the pitching and recruiting so that it was actually a successful uh, effort and not a waste of our time. Jo Joseph seems to be uh, somewhat enthusiastic about the idea uh, as, as our guests are as well. Okay. Um, uh, the, the room seems to think that's an interesting idea worth exploring, uh, and it might be something that it could become almost a position that, again, because it would be content neutral, could be something that you could request support for. Uh, in the past, we've requested support, for example, for advertising manager and things like that. Perhaps a, a donation support manager uh, position uh, within the universe, uh, the, the within the student leadership realm could be something that um, might be of interest to ask for funding for. Um, and possibly maybe one of our guests in the room would want to apply for that job if it came open. You can always ask. You might not always get. But, but I was about to say, there's no guarantee it would be funded, but we can ask. Uh, that's, a, that's a thought. Uh, any other ideas, suggestions? Hearing none, um, we will table that. Um, and uh, that is something that will also be discussed very um, frequently in one-on-one -on -one meetings that I will have with the leaders. Uh, and um, if you have any other questions uh, after the meeting that come to your mind uh, that you feel that either uh, Gail or Boyd or, or Michael would be in a better position to answer than me, obviously uh, I can help uh, facilitate those uh, Q and A's. So uh, happy to do that. Um, for those of you that are guests on this uh, meeting at every uh, Committee on Student Communications meeting, we have all of our media heads provide some updates about what's going on in their world. So uh, I think we'll start with the leader that's in the room, uh, Joseph, who is the Album, eight, uh, Album 88 General Manager. I'll uh, allow... Um, Wait, Joseph, you um, if you put in that second chair over, it seems to be audible. Yes. And then you can take your mask. I will allow Joseph a few seconds to come uh, to the uh, microphone and speak about what's going on in his world. Confirm with the audience they can hear. Oh, yeah. And, and when Joseph... Uh, Joseph's just going to ask if you can hear him. So go ahead, Joseph. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Go ahead. Yeah, so at Album 88, our main thing is trying to get RASFET best started, especially since we missed um, 20, 2021 and 2020 for obvious reasons. <laughs> and, and also getting 
trying a new form of training in which we have, in which our daytime, in which for those who don't like the graveyard process, process of coming late at night, they have the option of doing it in the day, but having it more focused on the technical aspects of just kind of like the do's and don'ts of being a radio DJ, as opposed to our nighttime portion, which is going to be more focused on around for people more interested in music, music and focusing more on the music aspects of our station. And also, and also, I think we finally are getting ready, finally have like podcasting up and run, up and running. People are getting ready, to, are starting to like produce the content, content and, and we're finally going to be able to have something to upload to our platform. So, so yeah, podcasting is probably like the biggest, biggest like achievement, which hopefully, hopefully we will have like finally have it like up and fully running this semester. Those are the main things that we've been focusing on. Awesome. Does anybody, uh, do, do any of the guests in the room have any questions about getting involved in the radio station in terms of, of going on air or uh, whatnot um, while you have Joseph's attention? That would be the time to ask those questions. So the question um, was, uh, what is the process for applying and what exactly does a DJ do? Joseph, take it away. Okay, so the application is on 10... Pin.gsu is a Panther Involvement Net Network, so pin.gsu.edu. You know, we do have various of the application windows open. I've been talking with, with the other members of management of when we should reopen it. It's still kind of up for debate. Still kind of up for debate because we're just focusing on a lot of different things at once. And I will I will add as a thought to that, we had a very, very, very robust application window in the fall that was almost uh <laughs> i don't want to ever say it's too robust that's that's not really true but it was so robust that we're still in the process of trying to get some of these people onboarded uh typically what we would do in the past maybe four or five years is we would open up two windows a semester our own our first window was so successful we had i think uh, eventually we had 123 applicants total i might be off by a person or two and it was like whoa that's a lot of people we weren't expecting it to be that much and so we never did open up a second one we um, we kind of you know worked on processing who we have uh that being said it is absolutely certain that that we will open another one this year it's really just a matter of joseph and his team deciding when that would be and when they're capable of doing it uh in light of uh, the team that they have now. And then you can go ahead and add anything you want to there, Joseph. Yeah, once the plan is, once we really get like RazFest really situate, situated, then we'll open up the application window. But until then it is a sort of T, uh, TBA. But yeah, that, so what, so yeah, further after. So once the application window, you apply there, you apply there. And then after that, after that, you would have the orientation in which I would read, read over our training manual, and then, or whoever the current standing GM would be at that time. And then, at, and then right after that, you would have like these uh, sit-in sit -in videos that we had to turn into a video format due to COVID, COVID, in which you would basically watch the videos, which is, a, which are basically training videos, and then folk, and then take a couple of quizzes after afterwards after that then you would be ready for a, for a legal session and after the legal session you have to sign some affidavit affidavits get a form notarized and then we can like put you into into like the graveyard training into the graveyard training or the daytime tra training and when it comes to what a dj does it's mostly just i guess it depends on how much interest you have have like we have DJs who are specialty show hosts, which they would, which they would basically pick, pick their own like specific genre of music to play, and then you also have more of uh, more just regular rotation DJs, DJs who basically like read off, read off and like play, play the music on that we have running at the station here. 
And uh, one thing I will add as a, as a little tag along to that question, uh, a process that has literally been going on for decades where Almeida is concerned is that the final step before going on the air, the affidavit process uh, that Joseph mentioned, uh, was generally an in-person process you would do with the advisor, myself, or whoever my predecessors were. And um, we're a step closer to making that an online quiz process. Right now, the updates to our policy manual that need to be vetted by the university as the license holder are, are in review. Um, with our legal. Um, we expect that we'll probably get some notes on that in February and um, no guarantee, of course, how quickly that will track after that, because they may say that all these changes are wonderful and it'll be quick, or they might say there needs to be more changes. So it's, um, but the hope is that by making that process faster, they can onboard DJs faster, which then means they can op open up their windows sooner and bring in more DJs so that we can uh, make the process uh, as efficient as possible. No, no, Mike, you can just pay Come it aboard. <laughs> right. No problem. Um, thank you for the questions. Um Opening the floor up to any of the leaders that are on the call. Um, let's uh, let's move over to Dina. Tell us what's going on with the signal. Hey guys, how are you? Um, so with the signal, not much. So as I took over in January, we were kind of struggling with having sufficient amount of riders in every section. Specifically, right now, our new section we're hiring in all sections. FYI, if you guys want to apply or anything, we're always accepting. Um, that's what's going on right now. And then with the new chance uh, changes, we're also reamping our uh, podcast section because we used to do that about two years ago. Was, uh, we had a good team with that and uh, it kind of just fell off. And now we have a lot of people that are interested in um doing that again and not only inside the organization but also outside there have been a lot of people interested in editing the podcasts creating it and kind of just starting that team again so that is something that i will be reopening um when we kind of get into the swing of things this first few uh week or two and then we're going to go into that but i think that's the only thing that's to update right now uh, uh, for those uh, for those of you that uh, would like to know more about um, applying to be a writer at the signal, um, Dina's email is signaleditor at gmail.com. Um, as she mentioned in her update, in particular, what they would really love to do is, is buffer up their volunteer section in the news writing section, the news section of the, the paper and website. So um, just know that uh, that opportunity to maybe uh, get onboarded slightly quicker uh, if you're willing to take part in that uh, does exist. And it's also for people that are interested in other aspects outside of writing. We have a marketing team, we have photography, we have graphic design. So really anything creative is uh, we have a place for you here. Thank you, uh, Dina. Uh, we'll uh, move on over to Ash uh, to talk about what is going on with New South. Howdy, y'all. Uh, is my mic sound okay, Bryce? I know I had problems earlier. Yeah. Nope, you sound great. Okay, great. Um, hi, this is Ash here. Uh, so at New South, we just put out an issue back in December, like, you know, a week before the semester ended, so it didn't really get a lot of screen time. Um, we usually have a contest at the beginning of the year, but we have delayed that slightly because our contest issue from the previous year hasn't come out yet. Um, but we're working on that now. Uh, I just sent the master file over to our production editor, so we hope we get that done soon. Um, but then we're hoping to get that issue out and then open up the contest again for the next year. Um, but yeah, I think that's all we've done lately. That was all from New South. Thank you. And I, I believe I'm leaving somebody out here. Oh, Paula, Paula, are you there? Can you talk a little bit about Underground? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. So Underground released their 12.1 issue 
uh, two weeks ago digitally, but uh, this upcoming Friday, the 28th, we are going to be having our release party at the Troy Moore Library from 6 to 8 p.m. And I invite you all to attend if you can. Uh, we're also going to have an open mic. And if you know anyone that's interested in signing up for it, on our Instagram, there is a link in the story to sign up for that. Um, and then we will be opening up submissions for this semester at the end of next week as well. And we're also looking for new staff members. If you guys know of anyone, um, they can email me at underground.journal at gmail.com. But that's all I have for underground today. Thank you. Um, any questions uh, for um, the Signal New South or Underground? I see a hand. Go on ahead and ask. Um, that is a question for Dina from the crowd saying that uh, the student applied in the digital marketing, marketing category. And, wanted to know wanted to know what you're back. and just give, you just give me a couple seconds to unmute you there, Dina. Okay, hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so right now I'm actually in the process of, because I get about, we're still getting a bunch of applications. So I kind of go through them. I set a day uh, every week to sit down and go through them. So to, to this week, that's going to be tomorrow. So if you sent it in and it is um, in the, what's the word? the email basically where you uploaded your resume and all of the information i will go through that this weekend and take a look at everything and then make sure to just check your student email uh the one that you provided in the resume and you will definitely hear back soon and that was a marketing director correct uh yes. correct all right so that's awesome yes you will definitely hear back from me like today or tomorrow and uh, if you need to provide slides. Uh, William Bridges is the general manager for NEO Network. Um, he is not uh, present at this current meeting, so I will just add that uh, anyone that is looking for opportunities to do video news can um, contact um, neon.generalmanager uh, at gmail.com. And uh, the news director for Panther Report um, is Melissa Perez. Um, she will be more than happy to hear from you. Um, the uh, production team is working on some of their creative projects. Cherish Collins is the production director. Um, I don't remember her email right off the bat. So if that is something that is of interest to you, talk to me after the meeting and I will make sure that um, I get you connected. Um, this is actually streaming right now on YouTube via the Panther Report channel. So you can watch this meeting back at the end and also check out some of the news reports that they've done uh, over the past year. Uh, so um, the one of the things they did last year is, is uh, an exclusive interview with President Blake that was quite interesting uh, and some other uh, pieces about various uh, events going on at the Student Center and beyond on campus. Um, are there any uh, orders of business uh, pertaining to campus life that have nothing to do with uh, any of the student media heads? I will add one because I have the card in front of me, uh, which is that uh, midterm elections for student government uh, will be going on. Uh, and it looks like the registration deadline for the primary is April 25th. Gail probably knows way more than me, so I will defer to her. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm lying. It says midterms. Those are for those are for. Okay, that's federally. Never mind. But it's a good thing to know. Thing to know. Uh, registration deadline for the primary for those of you wanting to e execute your uh, federal rights to vote, which you you know certainly should uh, employ. That is April twenty fifth, uh, twenty two. There are these cards that are in the um, student activities office. In um, actually, what's the exact name of the office, Gail? Student life. Student life thank yeah. you. Um, in the center of the second floor of Student Center West, or uh, rotunda, if you would. Uh, this is a wonderful handy dandy reminder of the various deadlines to make sure that you enact your franchise. Um, but I do think that it probably would be important if there is any information about student government. So uh, Gail, you can speak to that far better than me. So I will let you take the floor on that. Well, interesting you mentioned that. We did have a conversation at the SBA university-wide Senate meeting last night um related to the election commission the election commission has not yet been selected for sga 
um, but they are um, working on a recruitment team to come up with a great election commission team to promote a strong election process. Um, so SGA is working on that. They have not set deadlines and a firm timetable. And some of that conversation needs to occur with the signal in terms of what the ideals are for when we might be publishing the election issue um, and some of those kinds of things. So we're still working on those details. We are a little bit behind the eight ball on that um, and need to get things moving, but it is in the hands of Student Government Association, which is a RSO. And so the students are driving the car. Another important thing just to be aware of, is there, how to help promote all of that. And I believe they're still shooting for application or applications being available for positions by January 31st. Uh, Boyd just mentioned some information that um, Gail's going to, uh, do you want to repeat? Yeah. I was gonna say, go ahead. So um, SGA is still looking at a uh, timetable though, unlike the last several years where we have accomplished voting prior to spring break, it will actually be voting shortly after spring break. Um, and their anticipated release of the applications is by no later than January 31st, maybe sooner than that. I hope it's sooner than that because it does take a bit of time to drum up candidates um, in terms of all of our uh, essential positions. So um, there should be information coming out very soon. They have another meeting next week where hopefully they're going to hammer out some of the at least the timetable details after conversations with all the right people that are affected by that election timetable. So. Um, coming very soon, but anticipated uh, the election itself would likely occur shortly after spring break because we need to get those student leaders selected before the end of the semester. Allow for transition between old and new. Awesome, thank you. Um, so those are some of your uh, federal and student government uh, pieces of information. Any other uh, orders of university business that anyone would like to speak on? Uh, before I entertain a motion to adjourn. The opportunity, um, uh, I'm gonna look to Michael on this in terms of student activity fee committee. They have opportunity for new membership in terms of that student evaluation board. Um, whether that's for this mid-year allocation spring process, they may finish with the group that has been in place, but. Um, there will certainly be opportunity for new student representatives to serve on the student activity fee committee, which is the group that does review applications from RSOs like yourselves um, in terms of contributing input and weighing and measuring those requests um, in terms of how those allocations are made. So watch for information on that. It's typically done through a recruitment process by way of SGA, but there may be some nuances and some expansion of those recruitment opportunities so that it is a representative spread from across the university in terms of who those student representatives are on the board. And Michael's nodding along to all the things I'm saying. So Absolutely. The more diverse the group, the better. We absolutely do not want it to be all students from one representational area. To, to repeat what Michael said for those online that might not have heard it, Michael was, is uh, encouraging that it be a diverse group of people uh, and that we want people from multiple areas uh, so that we uh, get a multiple uh, level of perspectives. Uh, the only other item that we had on the itinerary that I am going to table uh, in light of the fact that I feel like there's an important voice missing uh, is uh, finally putting the uh, final stamp on our new bylaws, which for the most part uh, we are in agreement on. We just haven't officially uh, ratified them. There was a slight language change uh, that Jeannie Barrett had recommended in the last meeting. Um, she's not able to attend today, so I, I think it would probably be best if we uh, make sure that she is uh, present uh, so that we can make sure that we um, have the full and a uh, proper understanding of that when we ratify it. Uh, but for those of you that um, are guests, that we do operate under a series of bylaws that uh, we do renew uh, every three years. And so we have um, carefully reviewed them and uh, they are mostly ready to go. Um, we expect we will have those formally ratified uh, in the coming meeting on February 18th. Uh, and that is the next meeting. Um, Location to be determined, start time 11 o'clock 
Uh, and we will uh, continue to have a long range discussion about some of the budgetary issues that we've talked about here. Uh, so for those of you that are guests that want to know more information about how these conversations have proceeded and how they're going, uh, you can either contact me directly. My office is 404-413-1592 uh, or bmcneil1 at gsu.edu. Uh, or uh, I can give you updates after those meetings to let you know how those conversations have gone. Um, with that, if there's no other orders of business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll put forward a motion to adjourn. Motion from Ash to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Seconded by Gail. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved, so passed. Uh, thank you, everybody, and thanks to our guests for attending. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to come up to me and ask. And uh, for those of you that are members of the committee, we will see you in February. Have a great weekend, everybody.